Project Ripcord, a Vietnam fire support base in 172nd scale. Once the basic hardscape and landscaping was completed, it was time to add details, and there were a ton of them. The ammunition crates and cans, along with wooden pallets, mermite cans, drink coolers, fire bottles, generators, and sea ration boxes were added to the diorama using acrylic matte medium. Matte medium is an excellent adhesive and dries dead flat. It can be diluted up to about 10% with water. Distilled, please. No minerals, or funny chemicals, any more water and you run the risk of it turning frosty or even white. Woodland Scenic Scenic Cement is another great product, it also dries dead flat. It has a thinner consistency, which comes in handy, you can use a spray bottle to apply it, which we did for the ground work. The wire was an adventure. Posts were made by cutting down number 21 dressmaker's straight pins, and painting them green. The concertina coils were made by twisting 32 gauge annealed stainless wire, around a dowel mandrel turned on a small lathe. After the initial procedure was established, these coils could be turned out by the yard. Good thing, because there was a lot of concertina around the base. We used a marked length of cord to space the stakes, and the posts were literally stuck into the base, over which the coils were laid. We laid a 2 over 3 standard, as the exterior perimeter, and a 1 over 2 standard, for the inner perimeter. We also constructed some knife rest barricades from styrene rod, for the breaks in the wire, including the switchback exit, on the northeast end of the base near the water tank and small arms ammo bunker. Once the wire coils were in place, they were liberally sprayed with either diluted white glue or scenic cement. Speaking of the water tank, it was a story in perseverance just to figure out what it looked like. Several of the veterans we spoke with couldn't remember a tank, or thought they had water buffaloes and water blivets. We could see no evidence of either, and as we continued to research, a reference to a Navy container, or Navy cube, popped up. Several hours later, and a comment from one of our retired Navy guys, led us to figure out it was in actuality a re-purposed USNP-1 Lighteridge pontoon. Mike designed one in Tinkercad and printed it. RPG screens and chain link fences were made from fine wedding veil material, painted, and installed with the same posts we used for the concertina. Aiming stakes, those red and white striped poles visible in several photos, and artillery necessity, were made, again from cut down straight pins and painted white. They were then masked and the red band sprayed on. The stakes, like the fence posts, were easy to install, figure out where they go, and stick them into the surface. In some cases, a pin vise and drill were needed to, help, place the posts. Items that caused a bunch of experimentation were the cargo nets. We tried weaving embroidery floss, strips of paper, you have it, and nothing was satisfactory for the scale. On a whim, we discussed having paper laser cut to fill the needs. As it turns out, one of our members' wives has a cameo silhouette cutter, and a vector drawing was quickly made and sent to her. The resulting nets were perfect. A quick bath in green writ fabric dye followed by a dunk in scenic cement, a suitable drying period, and they were off to be shaped around various crates and pallets. This was done by using a bit of water, wet paper towels, and a wet brush, slowly prodding and poking to make the nets conform to the loads. Most of them were draped over the crates on the HLZ and near the 155mm howitzers, but one was saved for a special purpose. There were documented burn pits on the base. We took some short shot and unneeded resin ammunition dunnage, grounded in a coffee grinder, and established the burn pit areas. This debris was locked into place with scenic cement and, when dry, painted dark gray and black. Several areas got a light sponge chip of lighter gray to simulate ash. The pit on the west end also had some fluorescent red dabbed onto small spots, then a cotton swab was stripped of the cotton, which was glued down with white glue. After drying overnight, a pointed tweezers teased the cotton into smoke. There isn't a lot, it isn't large, but it is effective. Several latrines were scratch-built. Two of them illustrate the method used to dispose of the waste byproduct, complete with the cut-down barrel, the fuel, and an unlucky trooper and his stir-stick. If you've seen the movie, Platoon, or have been involved in the process yourself, well, I don't have to go into detail. The barrels were cut down from resin castings, and the fire was made the same way the fire in the burn pit was done. One of the latrines on the southwest end by Impact Rock has a story, 
It had been located up in the 155 mm battery area, but got blown over and landed downhill near the infantry troops. The infantry guys adopted this wayward structure and placed it over their existing slit trench latrine, and had the comfort of a seat while they did their business. The latrine under the HLZ, on the north side is occupied by a trooper catching up on his, light reading. One of the ripcord veterans saw the unpainted figure and initially thought the designer got the orientation of the newspaper incorrect, until he saw the figure painted and realized it was not a newspaper. The only stars and stripes that Trooper was looking at were on the bikini of Miss April 1970. Incidentally, after we were all but done we heard from an artilleryman that was on ripcord. He mentioned that they didn't need the latrines. They had an overabundance of boxes used to transport the fuses for the 105mm rounds which were identical to empty 50 caliber ammunition boxes. When the boxes were empty, the men would use them to, you know, do their business, latch them shut, and toss them down the side of the hill. War and desperation, the mothers of invention. The infantry fighting positions were mastered by a few of the members, led by Mike Roof. These masters were passed off to HQ-72 for casting, and once they were ready, they were painted. To add them to the scene, a motor tool was used to cut through the skin of Durham's, and then the foam was excavated to accommodate the positions. The actual castings were added in the same manner as the rest of the hardscape. A generous blob of Durham's, insert the casting, and smooth the squeeze out to blend with the rest of the terrain. To be sure everything was locked onto the base, the landscape texture materials and wire were liberally sprayed with woodland scenic scenic cement and allowed to dry. Once everything was dry, a glaze of flat clear lacquer mixed with a drop or two of Tamiya Buff, XF57, was airbrushed over the entire diorama. A word to the wise, apply a light coat and allow it to dry completely before recoating. You can always add more, but if you hose it on and it is too opaque, game over. As a final effect, a thin glaze of the ground colors was airbrushed at the ground level of all the bunkers and the concertina coils to visually tie things together.